Peter, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. I'll start with that because, let's admit it, we have a problem. We have um, <clears throat> very high energy prices in Europe at the moment. Gas is three times higher than normal. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've lost my voice. We have a problem. Um, in fact, the European Council will be discussing this uh, next week, and the Commission is putting a paper on the table. Um, it's, it's very worrying. Uh, it's also very worrying that this wasn't anticipated better, uh, so you're quite right on that to respect. Um, gas prices have gone up threefold, and um, the, uh, the electricity system, of course, is based on marginal pricing of the most expensive uh, thing in the system, which is usually the fossil fuels. There's also been other factors like Russia only fulfilling its contractual obligations, uh, lowering of storage capacity when normally you'd be filling it up, and the failure of an interconnector between the UK and the continent of, of, of Europe. Um, this is having real effects. There's a real effect on households and there's a real effect on uh, industry, particularly, I'll give you one example in Europe, uh, fertilizers are shutting down, they can't afford to run. That means they're not producing ammonia, which means there could be a shortage of uh, fertilizers for farmers next spring. But it also means that as a byproduct, they're not producing industrial CO2, which is necessary for the abattoirs, for the food production chain, for the transport of vaccines, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there's supply chain disruption going on in a really uh, important way. And it's not unique to Europe. Um, it's not the fault of the CO2 price. It's not the fault of market design. It's happening in China as well. China, coal prices have gone up 56% this year, and the governmental authorities have just turned off the switch to about 40% of the country's energy-intensive industry to um, <clears throat> avoid shortages. And one of those industries they've shut down with no notice is the magnesium industry, which means that uh, just two days ago, our European aluminium sector said, oh dear, we have six to eight weeks stock of magnesium, and if the Chinese don't uh, start producing again, we will have no ability to produce magnesium, uh, produce um, aluminium for the car sector. So one sector's impacts upon another. Um, as I say, this will be discussed at the European Council. I'm not going to speak at length about the vision because I think everyone here is familiar that we have, uh, we have a European climate law which locks us in, legally speaking, to the targets for 2030 and 2050. And we've tabled the legislative proposals and the um, financial programs to accompany that. What I'd just like to highlight is there are some good news stories going on. I think Europe has the capacity to lead the transformation of its industrial sector. Um, and this is one reason that the industrial policy is an integral part of the European Green Deal. Just um, two weeks from now, in Sweden, Volvo will roll off its production line, the first car made from green steel. This is um, coming from the pilot plant uh, using hydrogen, hydrogen from renewables uh, in the, the north of Sweden. It's the hybrid project, collaboration between LKAB, um, Vattenfall, SSAB, and with end consumers buying the product. So you need a market for these, these clean products. Most of the steel sector and the energy intensives have a project pipeline ready to go. And, uh, and my team is managing the European Clean Hydrogen Alliance, which has um, collected uh, one of its tasks under the hydrogen strategy is to develop a, a robust pipeline of hydrogen projects throughout the value chain. We've got uh, over a thousand projects which we're currently evaluating and will present to the uh, hydrogen forum in November. And we're also sitting down and talking to the European Investment Bank to see how we can, we can finance these things where the, the bank has a role to play and European funds like InvestEU can be deployed. Thank you.